This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with uh, Sean Jones, who, well, many of you will know, she's been on the show quite a few times, uh, enlightening us about regulation, policy, and the exciting world of Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today, Sean. Well, thank you very much for having me back on the show. I feel like the proverbial spent penny, you know, I just keep coming, coming back and coming back. And uh, <laughs> the very fact that people want to hear about boring regulations is always hugely uh, exciting for me. Yeah, you're officially the, our guest who has been on the show the most times. I think I checked it, it was like 11 times now. So <laughs> you're, 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 not, you're not falling off that podium anytime soon. Uh, do, 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 do I get a medal or some... You know? <laughs> Bottle of champagne would be nice. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll we'll see what what blockchain present we can uh, we can make you. That's a good point. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited back too. It's been it's been a while. Uh, fortunately, Sebastian may have been uh, covering a lot, but I was you know traveling and, and just super busy with work. And uh, and now hopefully it's going to get a bit better. I yeah, welcome back, Brian. How was your vacation? Yeah, it was pretty good. I was in uh, Florida going around there doing some scuba diving and uh, so it was fun although ridiculously hot <laughs> i don't understand how people can live there <laughs> well uh, let's get started with this topic so jean you sh you sent us this um distributed ledger framework proposal for gibraltar that uh, you've been very involved in writing and and you know we, when we were reading through this it was just such a a nice approach to how one could potentially regulate uh blockchain cryptocurrency businesses uh, of course that's um yeah once upon a time we talked a lot about that right we have a bit of license and i think that was a very uh, poor approach and, and and this seems a much better approach so why don't you give us some background about um gibraltar and what's going on with blockchain there Okay, so um, maybe it's worth just explaining uh, where Gibraltar is, because for a lot of people, they'll be reaching for their, their Google Maps to figure out where this place is. But it's, uh, it's a little piece of the United Kingdom that uh, sits at the mouth of the uh, Mediterranean, the opening of the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. Uh, it sits there um, attached, to, uh, attached to Spain. Uh, and it's technically a British overseas territory. Um, it's it's it's, um, it, it's a it's a town and a, and, and, and a jurisdiction of its own, all in one. It's um, it's been uh, part of or, or allied to 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 Britain for a very very long time, several hundred years. And uh, it has its own government. It has its own institutions. It's part of the European Union by virtue of being a territory of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, but it isn't a, a, a member state in its own right. It's it's sort of tagged on to to the UK's membership. So it's uh, maybe just helpful to understand where where Gibraltar sits. Um, but as I said, it makes its own it makes its own laws. It has its own government, its own parliament, its own uh, chief minister, its own financial regulator, the Gibraltar Financial Services Commission. And like a lot of small jurisdictions, it's looking for a new niche. It's um, it's facing um, Brexit uh, as uh, simply by virtue of being connected with the with the uk i was going to ask i mean that it's kind of an unrelated question but so these british overseas territories in fact do um have to deal with the realities of brexit uh is, is that right um yes i i think in fairness um uh gibraltar is the only one that's impacted in that way so in france in in your home um some of the French departments that are in all sorts of other places around the world, little islands in oceans and 
tagged on to 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 other continents are technically still part of France and therefore by some quirk um, part of the EU. I think the only British overseas territory that's in any way connected with the EU is Gibraltar uh, because it's physically sort of connected to uh, to to Spain. So right. it's a kind of unique, but yes, it's um, it, it, it's. It, uh, going to have to face up to the reality of Brexit, and and that's really a, a, a part of what has driven this initiative. So it's actually been interested in cryptocurrencies for, I should say, about three years now. It's had the the interest in doing something there. It's had a couple of local reports and consultations, and um, I guess the last, the previous report came out at the beginning of 2016, and it was basically saying we'd like to provide a safe, regulated environment for, at that time, just cryptocurrency businesses to be established and that can bring some economic value to the jurisdiction in exchange for which the jurisdiction can give uh, a proper um, regulatory base for those businesses that want that want that um, I guess in the crypto world there are businesses that very much want to have the credibility of being um, regulated in some way um, there are many uh, exchanges for example that are in the, that are in that situation and uh, there are those businesses that don't and Gibraltar's trying to satisfy a need for those businesses that would like to be regulated, but struggle to find somewhere in the world that will regulate them well. Um, I think Brian, you mentioned a few minutes ago, um, New York State and its bit license regime. Uh, and for those who are not fully familiar, bit license is a very comprehensive and um, burdensome and, and, and why it's a very broadly scoped piece of uh, regulation and uh, as a consequence it, it it had the effect of only having a small number of businesses that have applied for licenses and even smaller number that have been granted licenses um, because it's expensive to comply with the regime uh, it's not particularly startup friendly it's not small company friendly and so a lot of the innovation um, has moved out of New York and it's favored just the very large um, crypto businesses. Some view that as not having been a particularly uh, something particularly helpful to the to the blockchain and, and virtual currency world. Um, Gibraltar's tried to find a, a, a more balanced approach um, and so it set out with uh, to um, to uh, come up with a regulatory framework now for more than just a cryptocurrency businesses for um, businesses in the broader scope uh, uh, of DLT and essentially it's aimed at businesses that either hold or um, transmit um, other people's value uh, where they use DLT in some way to do that, to hold or to transmit. And those businesses, if they are based, either come to Gibraltar and become based in Gibraltar or may already uh, be operating in Gibraltar, those businesses can now be regulated with a regime that is very much fit for purpose. It's a regime which is designed specifically for DLT businesses. And as far as I know, that's not been done anywhere else in the world. And um, perhaps to give some context and maybe you can fill in on some details here. I mean, it's my understanding that uh, Gibraltar has, as you know, history also of doing what I guess a whole bunch of these countries do, which is kind of like, you know, uh, provide a regulatory arbitrage, an opportunity for regulatory arbitrage where a company can say, OK, we're going to you know, choose the best jurisdiction, the most friendly jurisdiction. Uh, particularly uh, gambling sites, right? I've done that a lot with online casinos, poker sites. And I think uh, Gibraltar is, is a major uh, destination for those businesses. Is that uh, correct? Yes, Gibraltar is very much um, a jurisdiction that's uh, 
made a niche out of e-gaming. Uh, there are two or three such uh, jurisdictions around the world. Um, some of um, your listeners and viewers will remember that I've talked before about the Isle of Man in previous shows. Uh, and that's certainly one that um, had also done a lot with uh, poker sites and e-gaming and made a, which now makes a very significant contribution to its economy, incidentally. Um, and uh, Gibraltar is one of the other jurisdictions that's, that, that successfully uh, attracted um, uh, e-gaming businesses. So yes, it, I don't know so much about regulatory arbitrage, but what it's tried to do is provide a safe haven for uh, for consumers, giving them the benefit of of of, a, of, of regulating their new t new type digital businesses. Uh, well and effectively, and therefore give customers confidence. Uh, but in fields where elsewhere in the world, they may not have, um, um, shall we say, um, exploited the opportunity. So e-gaming 10, 12 years ago, uh, and now is an important part of uh, the economy uh, today. Hopefully it will be uh, businesses in, in blockchain and, uh, and virtual currencies. Can you talk about uh, maybe some other jurisdictions around the world? Like, so we talked about you know, New York and BIST license and the difference, the sort of radical difference in approach there. Are, are there any other jurisdictions, I mean, perhaps apart from the Isle of Man, but that are taking this similar approach, or at least having these similar types of proposals um, written in, in favor of promoting sort of this ecosystem where virtual currency companies can establish? Yeah, I, th I think there are certainly uh, ju other jurisdictions around the world that have expressed interest. It was quite interesting because I was in Gibraltar when the uh, the consultation was opened about uh, three weeks ago um, for this uh, DLT regulatory framework. And uh, the day that it was, uh, oh, sorry, the day before it was, uh, it, it was sort of announced, um, uh, there was a statement from Russia saying it was going to uh, provide a, a, a kind of regulated space for uh, for the, uh, for blockchain businesses. But that was good. I think it, I may be wrong here, but I think it was announcing that it would do it by 2019, if I remember correctly. Um, other jurisdictions that have expressed an interest, well, you've got another EU jurisdiction, um, Malta, which has also recently said it would like to do something. Uh, and then further afield, um, you've got a Singapore that is very interested in, in doing things, but it's perhaps a little bit more conservative in its approach. Um, Hong Kong is also interested, but again, um, maybe a little bit more conservative in its approach. Um, China generally now is is moving into the more favorable zone and has um, is certainly encouraging uh, blockchain based businesses within the EU. Other jurisdictions that have been partially accommodating are places like Luxembourg, and in Europe, but not in the EU, even uh, Switzerland. Um, your uh, your home country, uh, Brian, has been quite progressive in some respects, but in fairly limited ways. And I, I don't think there's any other jurisdiction apart from New York that's actually come up with a specific regime for, um, for this space. And even New York was very much about virtual currencies rather than wider blockchain. So this is, this is really the, the first out of the starting gate. And, and I would not be surprised if other jurisdictions follow this model. You know, you need one success story, and I think you'll find that that other places around the world will 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 follow suit. That, that would certainly be encouraging. Uh, you know, I, you know when, you, when you look at the broader scope of things, I, I think New York was probably the first jurisdiction to, as you mentioned, you know, uh, implement uh, regulation and and and. Which is, you know, really the bad example of, of how to do it, as you, as you said. It has encouraged only the large players to be able to be regulated. Uh, only a few have gotten the license, and most have left. Uh, so that, that's perhaps seen by others as an opportunity to do things very differently. I think it's one of the downsides of being one of the first to do anything, is that uh, you, you, 
if anything, you're going to be you're going to come up with a more draconian style of regime, and I think that's what happened with with New York. I think other places have taken um, more of a, a wait and see approach, uh, allowed the, the the technology to evolve a little and uh, to see how the land lies, how what the business models are, and then think about um, uh, setting up a regulatory regime. And um, I think Gibraltar is the first of those to say, fine, we've waited and we've seen, and now we're doing something that's positive. So let's talk about the, the scope of the report. Um, the report is called the Proposals for a DLT Regulatory Framework. And what I thought was interesting about this is that it talks about, it talks about distributed ledger technologies quite a bit. It, it references that term quite a lot. Uh, it does talk about blockchains as well and, uh, and, and virtual currencies. In, in fact, the, the scope of this framework, uh, when you look at the, some of the use cases here, and we can, we can you know, talk about some of the use cases that are meant to be um, within the scope of this framework, a lot of them, in fact, are, are more on the virtual currency, it feels like, the virtual currency and perhaps blockchain technologies, but not so much on the private blockchain stack, you know, things like trade finance, retail insurance, uh, mortgage and loan applications, etc. I mean, I guess you could put some of those in, into, into private blockchains or consortium blockchains, but wh why, why did you feel it was pertinent to describe th this as a, as a distributed ledger technologies and not so much uh, blockchains or virtual currencies? We we have a real problem, don't we, in the, in 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 finding definitions that, that that are meaningful and that we can use universally across time. So, you know, I think a year or two ago, we probably would all have thought that um, uh, distributed ledger technology and um, blockchain was one and the same thing and of course they they have nuances and though those nuances are now much more widely appreciated um, but the, 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 the reality is right now we don't so what we've tried to do I think with this regime is come up with something that says if you use distributed ledger technology which also includes um, in uh, which which includes within it blockchains but not necessarily only blockchain so um, anything that has the properties of of distributed ledgers which which actually are um there is a definition in the cons consultation document for both blockchain and for distributed ledger but anything that uses this technology to store or transmit other people's money i mean i'm i say it it actually talks about value but i'm just using sort of common parlance so you should expect you it's not unreasonable as a customer to expect that the people who the, the integrity uh, of the people and the professionalism of the people um the the, the their risk management um approach and so on and so forth that those things are the same whether they're in the analog world or in this digital world and so whether it's a, a cryptocurrency uh, whether it's some other kind of, of coin, whether it's in the permissioned or the permissionless world, doesn't really matter so far as this regime is concerned. And I think in some of the examples in the consultation paper, it, it gives insurance, it gives um, it, it gives uh, uh, um, both trade and post-trade uh, activities, a whole range of activities. If other people's value is 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 being handled by by third parties, they, those third parties should be should be trustworthy and professional. Yeah, so that was one of the things that stood out to me, you know, because one of uh, a big criticism of bit license back then was that there was no real distinction between you know companies that would hold a person's private keys and not and, and we have that here but what i like even more about this is that again with with something like the license where i think a lot of uh, regulatory approaches you know they're very explicit and saying okay you got to do that you got to do that you got to do that and then of course even when they had written it the bit license thing there was all kinds of flaws in it or things that just don't make sense or completely go against the nature of of how some of these businesses are structured right like a lot of business models if you look at something like you know shapeshift being one of them 
it's just impossible to do under a license regime. And and what I really like here is this idea of, you know, of a sort of principle based approach where you say, okay, we have these big ideas, these big concepts that people should follow. And, you know, we're going to just hold them up to that standard without saying exactly how they're going to have to do it. And, and you know, it will change over time. And at some point, one thing is going to be appropriate and another point another. And it just feels like a really nice, uh, common sense, uh, clear approach. And the, the other thing that also I, I loved about this is because if you actually have these different, these different criteria or standards, right? Like risk management, or you talked about the integrity of people or protecting the interest of all the stakeholders, communicating transparently, all of those things, you know, a company will be a better company for following those rules, right? And I think a lot of, a lot of blockchain companies don't do that. And you would look at uh, you, we wish they did. I'm, I'm pleased you like it. Um, and I think that was, the, the, I think that it has been the challenge across the board. That's where a lot of um, policymakers and regulators have struggled um, is, is in thinking, well, hang on a minute. This, this is so new, this technology. Uh, the, the the use cases are still being discovered and, and, and new use cases are coming to light, it seems, almost weekly. There are new business models, new products, new ways of doing old things and wholly new things that never existed before. How can we find uh, a set of rules? How can we define a set of rules that works for all these things that we don't know? I mean, what we know today is that we don't know all these businesses, what they will be, what they will look like um, in six months, 12 months, a year, uh, you know, a couple of years time. Um, everything that regulators normally have to contend with is around what they know, you know, established business models, uh, a kind of status quo. And so they can say, well, we know how this works. So let's define a set of rules for it. Most of what's happening in virtual currencies and the whole um, blockchain domain is um, is unknown. Some is known, of course, now we've been, you know, the, the, this technology has been running a few years. Some models are quite well established. Obviously, virtual currency exchanges would be, would be a model which is now well understood. But there are a lot of new products that are being thought about and new business models and new ways of doing things and, and the technology which is evolving virtually daily. How do you tackle all of that? And the approach that, that, that Gibraltar has taken is to uh, say, we recognize that we cannot possibly write a set of rules that's going to be valid next week, next month, next year, five years time, today. We, we can't do that here because it's just too early and it's evolving uh, so quickly. So how do we provide a safe haven? How can we protect consumers? Um, how can we give legitimacy to those businesses that want it uh, without knowing um, everything there is to know? And so you, you, you've really put your finger on it. The approach that they've taken is to say, what are the outcomes that we want? Um, and obviously they are customer focused outcomes. And then what, how do we go about achieving those outcomes when we can't write a lot of detailed rules? Now, it's at that point that a lot of regulators and policymakers throw their hands up in the air and say, don't know. But what Gibraltar's done here very progressively, boldly, I would say, is to um, identify what the, what the principles are uh, of running um, financial services type business. Is. And then to say, well, then we will adapt rules from time to time that achieve the outcomes by meeting those principles. And what it takes to meet those principles tomorrow will be different in a year's time, perhaps. But we will adapt um, the rules to meet, to keep up with the technology and the evolving um, industries that are in this technology. And uh, that that's pretty unique in in um, financial services, but actually, a lot of fintech should be viewed in that way. I think. Yeah, uh, I I couldn't uh, I couldn't agree more. 
And I don't know if it makes sense to go too much into detail about some here. I, I think one I want to point out that I particularly like is uh, the principle of kind of acting, or, you know, protecting the interest of all the stakeholders. Uh, and, and I think that's something that you know, often doesn't happen, right? Because if you have today, a lot of these network of these projects, you have this distributed ownership and this distributed control, but that also means that there's not so much accountability really. And I think, you know, we see that even with something as large as Bitcoin, where, you know, to what extent are the core developers or the, the main developers in charge of Bitcoin accountable to Bitcoin holders? Really not at all, right? They, they do what they think is right. Uh, and and whether it really serves the interest of, of the Bitcoin holders. There's no, there's no accountability on that. Uh, and, and so I think that's, that's something really nice. And um, even just having that as a standard and, and having things like transparent communication, uh, and uh, an honest communication, right? Without having uh, you know misinformation, uh, you know those are, I think the the great great things. Yes, I I think it's worth pointing out that there isn't an attempt here to regulate the technology, so that that there's no attempt here to to regulate Bitcoin or uh, Ethereum. Um, uh, not the one could because of the way that they're constituted. Um, the, the, the purpose here is to provide a regulatory framework for those businesses that hold or transmit other people's value and do so using technology. That's the key point. I know we always say that this technology, one of its features is that it disintermediates. It does away with um, third parties. But in reality, that's not actually what's happened. I mean, it's it, it absolutely has that capability in the in 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 the in the uh, decentralized space in the permissionless space. But um, in a lot of cases, you entrust other people um, to perform various things with your with your money with your value. Um, again, the simplest example would be a, a virtual currency exchange. Uh, whether it's only for a short time or a long time, in some way, shape, or form, you're entrusting the, the exchange um, with um, either directly with your money or indirectly with your money. Uh, and it's quite right that those businesses should have you, you the customer's um, interests, as much at heart as um, their own interests. And so, um, that's what we expect of any other in financial institution. Um, we expect that of any other kind of financial intermediary. In fact, anybody that we give our money to who then does something with that, whether they then give it back to us or invest it or whatever, it it doesn't really matter. If, if they're handling our stuff, then um, we expect a lot of them. And there's been no way of adequately assuring that um, in the, uh, by a regulatory regime other than in New York State. Um, so here is an opportunity to do that across a broad swathe of businesses uh, if they're looking after your money, basically, and they're based in Gibraltar. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is your wallet, your complete user interface to cover all your blockchain needs. I've been using it and I've been loving it. Now, Jax supports a lot of different cryptocurrencies. I suppose Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, Zcash, Augur Rep, and they're adding many more. Keep responding to users' needs. Now, with Jax, the nice thing is that you can manage all of those coins within a single wallet and you are in control of your own private keys, they're not on their server. And there's a single 12 word seed that you can use to back up your wallet, all your coins and sync them across different devices. Talking about devices, they're on pretty much any device that you can think of. You can get it on PC, Mac, Linux, you can get it on smartphones like Android and Apple and iPhone, you can get it on tablets or even, there are even browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And on top of that, in JAX, you can actually exchange different cryptocurrencies for each other because they've integrated a shapeshift. 
uh, more partnerships and integrations are coming down the line in 2017 that are going to make JAX even better. So JAX is really making blockchain and cryptocurrencies accessible for the masses, easy to use for the masses. Make sure to, sure to get your own JAX wallet at JAX.io or you can get it from any of the app stores you are using. We'd like to thank JAX for their support of Epicenter. So, Sean, one thing that also stood out to me in, in this document is that it talks about out of scope, um, you know, use cases, out of scope examples. So it mentions Bitcoin uh, being one that, you know, doesn't fall under this and uh, there should, shouldn't be regulated that way. I mean, even, even if one said it, it was included, one would wonder, uh, you know, who would be accountable, right? It, it doesn't quite make sense. But uh, it said, you know, decentralized networks are excluded. Of course, where it change, this changes a little bit is when we talk about something, for example, like Ethereum, right? Where you had the decentralized network, but you also had the foundation that raised the money and, you know, developed it. And of course, this now is, you know, Cosmos, what I'm working on, Tezos, and so many uh, more projects are, are doing a similar thing. So do those generally fall outside of the scope of this regulation and this doesn't apply or does yes. it? Yes, the, the, there's, there's no attempt here to um, regulate any part of the um, governance machinery of, uh, of um, say, a virtual currency scheme. In other words, of the, of the underlying technology. So yes, you're quite right. The the consultation paper gives some examples of what um, Gibraltar believes will fall in scope, uh, and some examples that it feels it probably outside scope so a good example of something that's outside would be a, a, a merchant who accepts virtual currency in payment for goods or services you wouldn't expect them to be regulated as a as a financial intermediary um, similarly people who invest in um, um, coins or virtual currencies um, for themselves as distinct for those people who do it on behalf of others. So there's the, those are the kinds of, of distinctions that are, that are made. I sense in your question, though, something that probably we all have in the back of our mind, which is, you know, there's, there's all this decentralized stuff going around. And yes, it's, it, it, that there's the mechanism for, for effectively voting change uh, but there isn't necessarily the governance regimes uh, in place to ensure that all stakeholders' interests are taken into account. I think the one that's often given as an example is that so much of the mining power in, in Bitcoin rests in, a relative, in, in the hands of a relatively small number of, of players. Um, uh, and, and that is certainly very challenging. This particular reg regulatory regime doesn't attempt to address that. But there are other initiatives that are starting, I think, to address that. And so I'm, if you'll permit me just to slightly go off topic about Gibraltar, but there's, a, there's uh, an initiative going on in the standards field right now. So many folks have heard of the International Standards Organization, or ISO. And, and we come across you know, ISO numbers for all sorts of different standards, for all sorts of things from um, you know, parts in cars to messaging for financial services, to health and safety, to quality management, and a whole raft of stuff. And these are agreed standards by standards bodies across the world who get together in an international body um, and agree a set of standards. And in distributed ledger technology, there is an initiative that started last year. So the International Standards Organization formed what's known as a technical committee in the autumn of last year. Uh, and it had its inaugural meeting in Sydney in, in April. Um, and I'll declare an interest, I, I sit on that technical committee. And it's looking at a number of areas. So initially, the standards will be around definitions, you know, that we actually know across the world what we're talking about when we talk about distributed ledger technology or when we talk about uh, blockchain and that we have a common understanding. Um, but other work streams that are being looked at include um, 
amongst other things, interoperability and governance. And governance has, a, I think, a very important part to play in the kind of concerns that I think you're, you're talking about uh, or, or hinting at, Brian. Um, and so I think in time, as these standards emerge, and we'll probably see a series of standards, there probably will be a set of criteria that you will know whether if those criteria are followed, if those guidelines or whatever they emerge as are followed, that, uh, that, that this particular uh, coin system or decentralized um, system of some description, um, if it complies with that, that you have confidence that all stakeholders' interests will be, will be uh, adequately um, taken care of. I think it'll take some years for those standards to emerge. These things are never done overnight, um, but they will probably be good for the permissionless and the permissioned world. Of course, governance is a super interesting topic, and I'm, I'm always interested in on-chain governance. I think it's going to be hugely important. But that wasn't exactly where uh, I think I was kind of leading to with this question. Because, you know, if you look at today, and, and maybe we can speak about this also a little bit uh, later in the episode, um, there is a you know huge trend towards tokenizing products, tokenizing applications or networks, right? So we have, of course, this is coming with uh, the enormous amounts of money that are being raised like that. But so this includes both, you know, like blockchain networks, but also applications, right? So in the, uh, examples of that would be Golem or um, Gnosis, uh, which is incidentally is based in Gibraltar. Um, and it, I'm just wondering whether all of those would be excluded because they don't really have custody of, of users funds, right? That's, I mean, in a way, you know, they, they receive funds from a user, but kind of in return for, for tokens, more or less, you know, legally, I guess sometimes it's not structured like that, but that's kind of the mechanics and. And so they don't hold, uh, they don't really have custody of a user's fund. So is it correct that essentially all of those uh, wouldn't fall under this uh, regulatory regime? So I, 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 th I think you're exactly right. I see it, 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 this um, regulatory regime isn't about um, ICOs, but there are existing regulations in mo many jurisdictions and certainly throughout North America and throughout Europe um, that govern um, how um, these kind of um, financial, these kind of investments, and I'll use the term in loosely investments, um, how these kind of investments are promoted. And so, yes, some some of these ICOs will be treated like investments, like securities. Um, many try to structure them in a way that they're a product rather than an investment. So typically uh, access tokens and so on. And I think we will see um, regulators starting to take a greater interest in uh, in these uh, types of tokens and really start to um, deconstruct them to see whether they're really um, quasi investments quasi securities of some sort or not and if they are investments they'll treat uh, that they'll be expected to follow um, existing rules that govern those kind of investments. Unfortunately, like everything in this space, it starts off being a bit like the Wild West. So um, more or less at the moment, anything goes. Some of some of the things I've seen promoted, and I'm sure you too, have, uh, have certainly looked like they're in a very gray area. Um, some businesses, some promoters um, of, ICOs have spent lots of money getting legal advice to make sure that they don't infringe investment type, type um, rules. Um, and quite often the answer, the advice they get is, 
well on the one hand it could be and on the other hand it might not be um, it's a tricky tricky area um, personally as you know regulatory compliance is my is my thing um, I, I I think that in time uh, the rules will get stricter in much the same way as with crowdfunding generally rules got got stricter it's a trend when lots of people are throwing lots of money at something then the regulators well first of all the policymakers and then the regulators get interested so what i think the situation we have here is actually kind of analogous with the situation we have with these i mean the situation we have with icos and crowdfunding campaigns is kind of analogous with the situation we had with you know general cryptocurrency uh, and blockchain services where you know in in bit license for example you try to to apply this rules of financial services onto this thing and it doesn't really fit right so now we have with in gibraltar this principle-based approach which seems much more reasonable and appropriate to the environment and i think similarly if you just try to sort of put this it's a security comply with existing securities regulation uh, thing onto icos it doesn't really fit because there's just fundamental ways in which it's different so what people have done you know the, the most frequent approach so far has been to set up foundations in switzerland uh, and then those foundations essentially you know do those uh, those crowdfunding campaigns they raise the money they develop the network and then you know that network uh, essentially indirectly may gives value to this token so try to increase the value of the token um or at least deliver on the promise they made to to the people donating and and you know that it's not absurd right i think there's there's a case to be made that this is kind of sensible but it does feel awkward right foundations weren't really intended to be used like that and and for that reason i think a principle based approach to regulating uh, icos would be a, a great opportunity and, and a great service and i think if somebody did that and and then companies went through that you may really say okay this is you know this is a legitimate project it has lived up to certain standards uh, that you currently don't have and there's also a certain set of accountability that those people have that they currently just often don't have so i hope somebody's actually going to do that i think it, it would be an excellent thing um I, i'm i'm sure that uh the rules around um, ICOs will go the way of crowdfunding. In other words, they'll start to be um, narrowed down and um, made more appropriate to this 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 new uh, this new paradigm. I I think it has to be approached in a slightly different way because the, the way that they're promoted is well, in some senses it it, it, it is very similar. In other ways, it's it's very different from from uh, con conventional securities. Um, the one thing you we all want to be sure about is that the people who promote it um, have the capability of understanding what it is they're promoting and of um, giving representations to potential investors that they can properly understand. I think one of the really risky areas today is that um, unless you understand well um, the underlying code in a particular ICO, um, you probably don't really understand what it is that you're investing in, which means that a very large proportion of people who are investing in ICOs don't actually understand all the risks of that particular uh, you know, coin that they're investing in. Um, and what you hope is that the people who promote the business, who promote that investment, that they are responsible in the way that they do it, just as they have to be in, trad in the traditional investment space, so they should be in the ICO space. Uh, we all know that um, when the Dow happened, um, uh, the, the Dow incident uh, a year or so ago, um, we all know that the, the, the first thing that was challenged 
was, well, did we understand what we were investing in, really understand what we were investing in? And did we just take at face value what um, people who were promoting it, what they were saying? Could that be relied upon? And I think the answer after the, the so-called Dow hack was that people didn't necessarily understand what they were investing in and they couldn't necessarily um, take at face value everything that had been um, told them when they put their money in. I think that's right. My, my, my feeling increasingly, I mean, of course, since the Dow, there have been, uh, there have been a number of very important crowd sales that have um, raised uh, you know, several millions, tens of millions of dollars in, in, in only a few minutes, uh, and that there's an enormous fear of missing out. Uh, you know, when, when, when you talk to people sort of in the space, uh, or, you, know, you know, just people in your office, right? You start talking about crowd sales, like people just get excited. Oh, there's another crowd sale. And like, there, there's, a, there's inherently like a, a, a desire to want to in, invest in these things out of fear of missing out without even considering um, the, you know, the, even just the, 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 the function of the token or what they're investing in. It's just, oh, there's a new crowd sale. Uh, I don't want to miss out like I did on the last one. Uh, what, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I, of course, that's absolutely there. There's no question. And that is certainly is driving a lot of decisions. And, and I have no doubt that people are doing, uh, are making, you know, uninformed and ir irrational decisions. Yeah, uninformed decisions. Yeah, I, I don't think that's something a regulator can or should do something about. That's just a fact of human nature and human psychology. I think there are, though, but if you look at these these principles, you know that that uh, were outlined, you know, for the other. I think most of them you could just carry over. You know, you could say, okay, you know, are the people honest? Okay, you know, do they protect the interests of all stakeholders? That's going to be difficult to evaluate in many of those cases, right? There, there will be a lot of gray zones, but in some cases, probably in the in the real uh, in the real scams, right? who aren't just like genuine attempts, but didn't work out or, you know, genuine disagreements, but, you know, clear scams, I think it will be very clear. So again, I think that's something uh, that one could apply very nicely. You know, the money being raised, is it, you know, are the, uh, is it deployed appropriately? You know, is there, um, are, are, are there sufficient financial resources planned for the promises being made? You know, is there some kind of risk management, uh, corporate governance, I think as well um keeping funds separated you know if it is even between a sort of foundation where the money is or, or taken in for a specific purpose uh from other funds that may be around um so i think actually most of those you can carry over and i think that those are good things to follow and they will not prevent irrational exuberance and they will not prevent a, a massive bubble and prices going through the roof and crashing and i think that those are, are going to happen but i think what they could prevent is or, or they could really prevent uh, the scams right the, the ones that are just outright schemes and, and dishonest schemes making you know false promises uh, to get money because it seems easy at this point. And I think that's something worth doing. There are two kinds of misrepresentation. There's, um, well, actually there's probably more than, than two kinds, but, um, first of all, you've got, you've got fraudulent misrepresentation. So, you know, people who, which would be typical in scams, you know, you just make promises without having any real intention of, of, of carrying them out. Um, just to to get other people to 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 invest in the scheme, um, you you've got negligent misrepresentation, which is the representation where really you're holding yourself out as 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 someone who understands and knows this thing, but you haven't really um, exercised your responsibilities of checking it all out and making sure that the representations that you make are um, accurate and can be relied on. And I think um, some of the things that happened in the Dow last year would probably fall into, into that category. And then I suppose you've just got honest misrepresentation um, where you know you, you, you truly believed something was, was the case and you had 
pursued it and it, it it isn't so much misrepresentation it just didn't work out um the, the, but but these things are the same things that apply in pretty much everything to do with investing and you know you say well you can't protect against uh, natural exuber people's natural exuberance you can't necessarily protect against the the fear of missing out and of course all markets and pricing is driven largely by that um but what you can try and do or certainly what regulators try and do in the investment space is to ensure that products are sold to people um, who may have the ability to understand what it is that they're investing in. So, you know, there are there are different regimes in different jurisdictions, but there usually are rules that say that certain kinds of investments can only be offered to people who um, who who are professional investors or who have um, significant, uh, sufficient wealth that they understand about investing and that they're not about to, you know, that they're people of modest means who are about to throw their life savings into something because they, you know, they believe it's going to be the, the, the next big thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, it's great that you bring that up because it's something I, I did want to bring up uh, as well. And, and I, I have huge, I think it's, it would be terrible uh, going down that direction. And, and we are seeing the first uh, example of that at this point, right? Which is uh, Filecoin. So they have announced uh, and, and they've set up this new platform called CoinList to do uh, their ICO. And of course, Filecoin, uh, many of you will be familiar with the project. We've had um, Juan Benet on before. So Filecoin is basically the sort of economic uh, incentivization system behind IPFS, which is a very well-known project a lot of interest around that, a lot of enthusiasm about the project, uh, very um, competent investors in it. So w what happens when you say, and, and, and they are going to uh, restrict their uh, ICO to accredited investors. So what happens in that case? Well, first of all, um, in the US, I think it's about 3% of people uh, qualify for that. So they need to have more than a million dollars uh, of net worth, I think, excluding their house and uh, or two hundred thousand dollars in salary per year. So, so you've cut it down, right? You've eliminated uh, most. I don't know. Let's say eighty percent or ninety percent or not something, or maybe even more of people commonly investing into uh, in uh, cryptocurrency systems, ICOs, etc. So you cut those out, and you do this. You do this crowdfunding campaign. Uh, all the tokens go to those guys, but it's, I mean, it's transferable. It's peer to peer. I mean, the whole point of this technology, so it goes on exchanges and, and then all the others can also go and buy it in there uh, at probably like a five X premium or something. So that seems just a complete, uh, disaster, uh, going that direction. So I'm, and, and I think also the idea, okay, if you have a million dollar or if you are this uh, credit accredited investor, I mean, actually nobody, there's no accreditation. It's sim simply how much money you have. So I'm, I'm, I think it would be a shame if uh, more crowdfunding campaigns go down that route and it would be very negative for the space. I think, um, I think in a way there'll be a form of, uh, b before we see any significant regulation in this space, we will see a kind of self-regulation. So there are those organizations that uh, um, help ICOs get off the ground and, and, and the ones that I've encountered, the vast majority seem to um, have their own internal criteria for uh, checking out what the true value is behind the coin, what the technology is, what it is that people are investing in, because their their reputations depend on it. And I think we'll probably see then a scenario where you know that if it's being promoted by this particular um, organization or, that, or, or, or person, that you trust that they have... Um, that they've carried out that kind of due diligence because they understand it better than you do. And I think, um, I think in a way, uh, a lot of the funds management business in the traditional and the analog world works in that way. So you have investment managers who uh, 
um, uh, handle a variety of, of, of collective type of investment um, funds uh, of one sort or another, and you end up trusting the investment manager because their past performance is good, because their skills are good, because they've got a great team who do all the due diligence and so on. And I think we might see more of that emerge in the in the ICO space. Unfortunately, probably only after um, some people lose money and others don't. But I rather suspect with this exuberance around ICOs at the moment, a lot of people are going to lose some money and a few people are going to make some money. Um, but once the reality hits that not all ICOs are equal, um, uh, you, 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 you will start to see, I think, reputations being built on, you know, who, on the pickers. The st what, what would have been the right stock pickers in, uh, in the analog world will be the right ICO pickers in the in the digital crypto world. I, I kind of agree with, with Sean's position on this. Uh, in, increasingly, I think that a lot, of the, a lot of the protections also will come from self-regulation. I, I've, I've, I had a discussion recently with someone uh, who, who, who was sort of on the, on the, on the side of, of Brian. Um, essentially, I, I would say even, even more um, that his position was was, was even more, uh, uh, I guess, um, on the free market side, uh, where he was saying, "Okay, well, there's going to be there's going to be a bubble. People are going to get hurt, and that's okay." You know, um, I, I think that obviously that's not something that's desirable. And that we don't want to um, um, put the brakes on innovation. And I think, as you mentioned, Brian, it would be pretty disastrous for the space if all of a sudden only three percent of people could. Invest in cryptocurrency projects or ICOs, when in fact, you know, as you mentioned, you know, people can just go through exchanges afterwards and probably end up paying a premium. On on the other hand, I've I've also met people that, you know, people not necessarily in the cryptocurrency space or in the blockchain space. I, like I met this one guy recently, and he's like, "Oh, you you work in in blockchain? Well, I invested in this, like, insert scam name." blockchain here and he's showing me the app and there's like literally a pyramid with like him somewhere inside this little pyramid with like the people that have referred him to be able to buy it into this currency and you know there's there's two ends of the spectrum and we have to find ways in which we can on the one hand uh continue to have innovation in this space and and uh, and allow for these projects to be funded but also protect uh people that are are going to get um, taken advantage of on one on one side of the spectrum. I think self regulation, um, in a lot of ways, is is one is one way to do that. Hopefully, that'll happen before some kind of crisis. Uh, maybe the DO was the first crisis. And now we're already starting to see that. So I mean, actually, there, I'm, I'm uh, self regulation. Of course, is 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 a desirable thing, no question. But I think it's going to be very hard to get appropriate levels of self-regulation because just the incentives aren't there. Like nobody really has uh, incentives to, to do the kind of thing that uh, that would be uh, would be good. So I actually, again, I think there's some some kind of principle saying, okay, you follow certain structures, certain frameworks, certain rules. So uh, you know, there's some accountability. But afterwards, yes, I mean, people are going to uh, put money in and they are, uh, they're going to, some of them are going to do it without due diligence and some of them are going to do it at the wrong time and sell at the wrong time and they're going to lose money and, and, and they will be uh, uh, regretful of that. I mean, I, I've certainly noticed personally that uh, just in the last few months, there's been a, or last two months even, a significant number of people outside of this industry who are like i mean i need i want to you know invest in some of these projects and uh you know who, who don't know much uh you know they don't have bitcoin you know haven't bought bitcoin they haven't like used some cryptocurrencies before but you know they see uh, i mean they see this opportunity and uh and of course if this increases more prices would go up more and more people will get interested and at some point it is going to come down uh e even even though in the long run it may you know it may go up much more and and and, and i think um 
I think that's, in my view, it's unfortunate, but there's so much innovation happening and at such a rapid pace that it's it with the downsides of, of shutting this off, even if it's possible, which I don't think it is, would be um, too big in my view. Yeah, I think there's some low hanging fruit that you can have in terms of what I would call self regulation. Um, things like security, uh, like having proper security protocols that are sort of frameworks that everybody doing a crowd sale or a, or a token sale adhere to. Um, specific types of governance mechanisms or governance frameworks, right? So whatever whatever those may be, um, that again, you know, have been sort of tried and tested and and um, and are recognized by the community at large as viable governance models. Of course, there are things that you can't, you know, put into these frameworks, but I, I think there's some low hanging fruit there that you could probably, of course, I haven't thought of this much, but you, you probably um, account for some level of, of security and uh, protections in just the way that things are built as a standard. Of course, you know, doing multi-sig and all kinds of things. Yeah, people should do it, right? They should have like a security, uh, you know, proper security, etc. But what does self-regulation mean? I mean, who, who is actually going to enforce that? You know, people will try to do it or, or not. Most of them, I'm sure, will try to do it and they may do a good job at it. But that's not regulation, right? That's just people trying to do something that's common sense. And it does. There's no accountability there besides things going wrong and then people getting angry at them. I think when we start to see um, international standards exist, um, and they will, I'm sure, cover things such as well, we've already talked about governance and um, uh, and interoperability, but but other areas are around identity, privacy. Um, um, smart contracts and, and so on. And, and work has already started on some of these um, uh, topics. I think once there are standards and, and they're published, they, they may not be enforced, but um, if you are trying to promote um, the next big thing, you want to be able to say, but this thing that I've created complies with you know i serve one two three four five whatever it's going to be part one or two or three or four or whatever and that has some meaning uh that you then know ah right that has a um, um a satisfactory uh governance um regime or it's been um a certain approach to security has been followed or a certain approach to privacy has been followed and I think these things will start to become valuable. Unfortunately, they, they will take time to emerge. I, I said this earlier, and I, 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 I think we, we need to take a, a, a reasonable time you know, view about the time horizon. But I think these things will emerge, and they will lend credibility in areas that you can't necessarily regulate but which become meaningful. So you know when you, certain kinds of electrical products or children's toys, you see a CE mark in, in, in the European Union or you see a kite mark in, in, in Britain or w whatever. These, uh, you, you know then that you can trust that they've been made or designed or function uh, in a certain way to a certain standard. And you might then choose to to buy or invest in one uh, and not another because you know that it complies with that standard. And maybe in time, there'll be forms of certification. So you'll be able to submit your um, great ICO idea to uh, that you claim has been designed to meet this particular international standard. And uh, there will be bodies who will examine it and give you a certificate and say, yes, you do actually comply with that. And that will give trust and confidence um, to investors and to customers. Yeah, I, I like that idea. So before we wrap up, uh, com coming back to the, the proposal, can you just walk us through sort of the, the, the roadmap 
um, from where the situation stands now with this uh, DLT framework proposal into taking it to being enacted in, into law? Okay, so the stage that it's at today, so we're recording this at the end of May, it's been uh, open for consultation for around uh, three weeks now, so it has uh, another week or so to run. I'm quickly trying to see if I can if I can find the date that the, the consultation closes. Um, the, the, the input, uh, so feedback has already been coming in to the Gibraltar government, and it will consider that feedback in relation to the proposals, decide on the basis of that feedback as to the final go, no go, and what changes, if any, might be made to the proposals. And um, then it will proceed into legislation through uh, the summer of, uh, of, of this year, 2017. And the idea is that guidance to help prospective um, licensees will become available, be published in the last quarter of this year, uh, with the view to um, applications being accepted from the 1st of January 2018. Uh, there will be, under these proposals, a transitional period. So businesses that um, base themselves um, in Gibraltar and then make an ap application to um, be licensed under this regime. Um, they can, um, certainly for the first three months, or at least that's the proposal. Um, so if this becomes law on the 1st of January, that'll take them up to the end of March. So long as they get an application in, in that first three months, uh, they can continue to operate until uh, their application has been determined. So they won't be doing anything illegal by uh, operating uh, whilst their application is being considered. Uh, and they won't have to wait um, until they get their license before they start their business. So it's um, that's the timeline. And, and really, as these things go, this is pretty fast. That's one great thing about uh, Gibraltar is that being... Uh, small and having a, uh, a relatively small regulator, they're also very agile and very nimble. Um, and I would say that they have an absolutely fantastic team. We've all heard about how the FCA in the UK has its project Innovate, and, it, and, and there's some great bunch of people, but because that's such a large regulator, uh, there isn't um, a very quick if you like cross-fertilization of ideas between the innovation people uh, who operate for example things like the sandbox and the people whose everyday job is is uh, authorizing and supervising and enforcing licensed businesses uh, in gibraltar they have a, a a great what they call their innovate and create uh, create team and most of the members of that team have other day jobs, as it were, within the regulator. So they're all from the various departments. And so those ideas um, are cross-fertilizing. And what they've asked is that if you have a business idea and you think that it um, might be uh, uh, licensable under this regime, um, give them a call. Uh, arrange a meeting or uh, if you're abroad from Gibraltar they'll set up a conference call and you can discuss your idea without if you like without obligation before you make any application uh, and, and and they will consider uh, your business model and give you feedback on what they believe will be the appropriate uh, and proportionate um, um, rules if you like that you would need to follow because this always the lawyers hate this this that there isn't a hard and fast rule book it's the hard and fast piece is around the the principles how you apply the principles varies from business to business from business model product um, technology and uh, and they have a great team who actually understand this stuff and will talk uh, listen to what you have to uh, explain about your business idea and then tell you how they think that that can, the principles can be met. 
so that you can have that in your mind before you put the application in. Uh, and so they'll work with you rather than uh, in a kind of adversarial or gatekeeper role. They will help you develop your, um, your, your, your ideas for your application, your license application, uh, so that you've got a chance of getting it rather than not getting it. Cool. Well, Sean, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much for the work you're doing there. I think it's a fantastic work and it's very important work. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'm sure this is a topic we'll be, continue to come back to for many years. And, and uh, yeah, so thanks so much for coming on. Of course, we're going to have uh, links to Sean's website, uh, maybe some of our previous episodes with her, also the the framework, uh, which is which is a really nice uh, a nice document, very readable. Uh, in we the show need notes. to put the link in the show notes to the um, to to where folks can read this uh, consultation paper. Yes, and they can find it. Exactly, we will do exactly that. So hopefully, you know, people are interested, go a bit deeper, can check that out, or maybe you know, get in touch with the authorities in Gibraltar or with Sean to to set something up there. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. And thank you both. It's lovely as always to to do this show with you. You you two are the are the great uh, broadcasters of uh, of this industry. I mean, you you've been uh, you, the, the epicenter is is at the center, still at the center, and you guys keep on going. Well done yeah. to you all. Yeah, thanks so much. Actually, we just passed a, a million downloads uh, about uh, a month ago or something. I wanted to do, do some sort of announcement about it, but. Uh, we're all too busy, but yeah. So uh, I mean, we have we have seen some of that same, I guess, uh, exponential growth that uh, is going into prices. Although, of course, not not quite as dramatic. Yeah, Can so I get that percent of coin? Where do I get them from? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thanks so much for our listeners for you know once again tuning in. If you want to support the show, you can do that by leaving a review for us, uh, iTunes or one of the other platforms you listen to. That helps new people find the show and it makes us happy. Uh, or you can uh, leave us a tip. We have uh, tip addresses for Bitcoin and Ether in the show notes. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.